Um, thank, you, thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, I'm actually incredibly nervous. When you say I've done lectures at LSE, I've done a couple of seminars for them <laughs> with largely overseas students. Uh, so, you know, they didn't really mind what I said. <laughs> it just kind of, everything went down all right. Obviously, talking in front of the University of Sussex alumni is a rather different prospect. Um, and it's the first time I've ever done a lecture like this. So forgive me for nerves, forgive me for not being good enough to the types of people you normally have at these events. Um, I'm just going to kind of say some stuff and we'll see what you think about it all at the end. And as to that um, lovely beginning, I said to Stephen, the nicer you are about me, the tougher the audience is going to be. And he said, it's Sussex. I thought, right, OK. I know where I am. And that Ladies and gentlemen, I brought up here not, not because it's, uh, this is called a mobile, some of you will remember it, um, uh, it's to keep time, there's nothing rude in, in that, I'm just conscious that there are drinks being served in close an hour from now, so you haven't got long to listen to me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I blame Tracy Paul, who was one of your alumni, who got me into this, and now she's not here with me this evening, because I would never have said yes if Tracy hadn't twisted my arm, because I just don't think I'm probably good enough in terms of the type of uh, lecturers that you have before you at these sorts of events. Anyway, I'll give it my best shot. Um, the, the, the thing I would like to say to you about the question posed this evening, which is can we have a fully integrated and equal society or is it a pipe dream, which is the day we give up and decide it's a pipe dream is the day we should close up our universities, our colleges, our schools, our social policy, our democracy and go home. Uh, and what a sad day that will be, because actually we have to fight for social justice, we have to fight for the freedoms of people to enjoy equality in our society. And often that involves uh, uh, asking difficult questions, which doesn't always make you popular, and coming up with very hard answers that are not always straightforward and easily to put into place. And so at the very beginning of all of this, government finds uh, and politicians find the need to be popular in order to get themselves elected and in order to be re-elected they have to find simple solutions that people notice which is a very different thing to finding complex long-term solutions that made very significant changes to people's lives not over the lifetime of a parliament but over the generational shifts in families and in communities. So often uh, these things start with things that I think are very complicated and are very difficult and should not be left to politicians alone, which is why universities and educators are so powerful and so important in this. In terms of is it a pipe dream, I feel people often say the poor will always be with us. For example, that there will always be people sleeping on the streets that there will always be homelessness and that these things are not solvable problems. And I put it to you this evening that these things are. I mean, sadly, as I stand before you this evening, I began the morning, uh, actually, I was somebody that was involved with as good as ending street homelessness in the United Kingdom in the early 2000s, including in Brighton, in, fa in fact, in East Sussex. Um, and actually, I had to go on Radio 4 this morning on the Today programme to talk about the death of a man who passed away the night before last uh, in the um, tube, um, uh, the sort of passageway between Portcullis House and the tube station. And I pointed out on Radio 4 this morning that out of the death of this individual under politicians' noses needed to come change. But actually in Brighton, uh, this wasn't in the speech, but in Brighton last year, 17 street homeless people lost their lives, uh, according to the local charities, and I believe them on the streets, and uh, 14 passed away during the course of 2017 on the streets of central London. And uh, the gentleman that died the night before last is the second death that we've had on the streets uh, since Christmas here. There was another individual that passed away uh, in Birmingham as well. So it got attention, the one that passed away this morning, and I can only be grateful for that attention. But actually, we cannot therefore allow that death not to be a catalyst for action going forward. 
I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned over the past three decades with as much humility as I can possibly muster. Um, we got some things right and we no doubt got some things wrong and I include myself in that. I certainly got some things right without a doubt but I think I also got some things wrong. wrong. And I suppose, again, the reason I think that the, the title that you set me needs to have hope and optimism in it is because I think most people get up in the morning actually wanting to help people and not wanting a society that leaves people behind. And that quite often at the moment, the mood music, the conversation, the discourse, both in the media and everywhere else, I feel a sense of pessimism and hopelessness. And we cannot let that uh, go on in our society in every single vein. And yes, as uh, Stephen said, it is a reflective time for me. I have only left the civil service. I have no regrets about leaving. I might be worried about the future. I might be worried about what the hell I might get up to every single day. But my God, is it delightful to be unfettered and to be able to say exactly what you think. I think most ministers thought I did that anywhere. Well, boy, they're going to find out what I really think. Um, you did uh, steal from my blurb uh, some of the words about the last uh, few decades and the reason I wanted to, to focus on that is a couple of things. So Blair was the Prime Minister for a whole decade and Gordon followed him for, tw uh, for two years afterwards. So for 12 years this country, uh, whatever your political persuasion and whatever your beliefs about Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, we had one government that charted one course. Now, I happen to be quite a supporter of a lot of the domestic reforms put in place by that government in terms of health, welfare, poverty reduction, changes in schools, uplifting universities, I could go on and on and on. But nevertheless, the point I'm making is that we went in one direction and people knew what that direction was. They may not always like it, but they knew where they stood and the civil servants and local authorities and businesses, all of us knew what direction we were heading in. And the point that Stephen made, which I would reinforce, is subsequently we've had three prime ministers in a short decade, if you include Nick Clegg in that, because he always thought he job shared the prime minister's job. Little did you know that actually he set up his own number 10 camp. So actually at one point I thought we were servicing two prime ministers. Don't use that, don't Twitter that, because he's a decent guy. Uh, despite various things, um, but basically we had three prime ministers and three significant referendums in a country that does not do referendums. So that's the point behind that. These are different things that have happened in the last uh, 10 years. And those things have had quite seismic changes that actually have affected lots of people's way of life, but also the systems in place that keep the country running. From the homelessness are through to crime and antisocial behaviour, the Victims Commissioner, the Troubled Families Programme, the inspection into child sexual exploitation in a town called Rotherham, and more latterly the review into what is called isolated communities. I'd say those roles have sometimes tested my faith really in our innate kindness as human beings and our innate goodness. However, I've come out the other side and not only realised they were privileged to undertake and to be part of, but they have reinforced my optimism about uh, humanity and about the goodness of people trying to do the right thing. The privilege comes from being allowed to get under the skin of some of the most challenging issues facing our most vulnerable communities. To be able to have given a voice to some of the most powerless citizens in our society in things like listening to troubled families. To listen, to care for those without homes, families made vulnerable by the problems that beset upon them, or indeed the teenage girl in Rotherham who has been groomed and abused to be able to challenge the system and indeed society that has too often closed its ears and eyes and walked on by. The choice to do what is right rather than what is easy is a tough one in our society, but one that answers the question about the pipe dream. My reflection on politics is it sometimes falls too much into what is left or what is right as opposed to what is right or wrong. And I think we get caught in these political uh, situations rather than trying to chart the course 
uh, that will actually ensure people in my line of work to be less poor, more equal, and have a greater say over their own lives and over the society in which they live. So much is about the importance of bravery and being brave, but it's also about looking at things differently. I quite often get asked and have a reputation for talking truth to power, uh, dare I say it, to this audience as if it's some kind of uh, university qualification or it's an MBA or um, it's a 21st century management technique. It's, it's really, really not. It's something much simpler than that and at the same time much harder. Um, I, I quite often get asked to go to the uh, Cabinet Office's nudge unit and um, the nudge unit is set in a nice little bit of Whitehall. It's very lovely. It's not quite as lovely as the building we're in this evening, but not far off. And you walk into it and it's got like Smarties and uh, coffee filter things, all the things the rest of us don't have in the civil service. Not that I've got a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> and you know, it's like, it's like a scene out of W1A or you, you know that thing about the BBC? So there's pods. Who knew what a pod was? Anyway, so there's pods and all sorts of trendy things. And at the front, thank God I've got a lectern and a microphone. I kind of might know where I am with that. This, I had to sit on a perfect perspex little stool at the front. There were two stools and this guy with a goatee jumped up next to me looking really trendy. It's like he just walked off a Channel 4 set and I kind of t struggled to get up on this thing. And I looked round and I said, you know what, I've had second thoughts about all of this. Call me back when you set up a shove unit. In the meantime, you carry on nudging. It was just a classic, classic moment where I was such a fish out of water. And I feel the same sometimes about being asked to talk about um, truth to power. It's not some kind of macho fight, uh, you know, go in and tell ministers what you think, stand up to them, all the rest of it. It's actually harder than that. I could have a showdown with a minister any time. We could all have showdowns, particularly if you feel passionately about something or you think you're right. You can go to town over it. Persuading people to change their minds is a very different process. And, and you know, going at them, in my experience, doesn't work. It doesn't work for me anyway. I think it's about holding up to a mirror. It's holding up a mirror to what you have seen and what you have heard and allowing people, no matter un how unpalatable that is to look at, to look at that mirror for themselves and make their own judgment about what that looks like. And that's a very difficult process, but it's a very difficult, different thing. It's about getting to the bottom of complex problems, asking the questions that no one wants to ask, and challenging the status quo, and asking what it is that isn't working and why. So in terms of poverty and social exclusion, and the homelessness job as one of those, it was about asking outreach workers uh, and getting them to agree and see and own the fact that if our goal was to get long-term, very vulnerable people off the streets, sometimes it meant not helping someone else that was more able. Now that's a really tough thing. We shouldn't have to ask people to make those choices, but we did ask people to make those choices because they said to us, we are tired of not being able to help the people with drug, alcohol, mental health problems who actually were living on the streets and couldn't come off the streets for all sorts of reasons because we had nothing to offer them. And it's much easier to help somebody that has no problems, that just wants a hostel bed that you can do a quick turnaround in. So we asked people to do something that was very, very difficult uh, because they told us that's what they wanted to do in order to get to the most vulnerable. It is easy to fix the newbie. It is hard to fix the vulnerable one. Not a choice we should always have to make, but a choice that we do have to make in every area of social policy every single day. Sometimes it was challenging the soup runs who would not coordinate their help on the streets and ended up on some occasions creating more problems than they thought they were solving for homeless people. Lincoln's in Fields, an area known to many people in the legal world not that far from here, some of you will remember when it was an open park and not a closed park and gated park. And in that area, the numbers of people that slept rough there were just huge. Huge, huge, huge. On a Tuesday night between 7.45 and 8.45, 12 soup runs visited that area. 12. The homeless people living there were sick to the back teeth of people arriving with soup, doing their good, when what they wanted was a permanent long-term solution to moving off the street. 
I'm not saying right now, with the numbers of people sleeping out on our streets, to our national shame being the degree that they are, that I wouldn't go out there and help somebody directly if I felt there wasn't that in place. But at this point, uh, 15 years ago, we were not in that situation. The solution to rough sleeping is neither cheap, easy or basic, and it's more than a cup of soup and it's more than an empty shelter bed. Challenging the system relentlessly, for example, that psychiatrists and doctors never ever would do an assessment or indeed have a conversation with somebody out on the street, however mentally ill, we couldn't get them out on the streets. They felt they were doing me an enormous favour to actually, for which I was terribly grateful, for which they would come to a day centre on a Tuesday for two hours. We had to show them and be with them and explain to them, I'm nearly breaking a lectern, I'm getting over carried away with myself, um, we had to kind of involve them in realising that they could do something different, that actually you know, holding up the mirror to say, look, you're a doctor, you're, you know, you're the white coat here, you're the person they might listen to in a way they're not going to listen to somebody like me, will you help us with this? Knocking heads together of the two largest day centres in London, both run by religious faith bodies, both marvellous places, but they thought it was absolutely okay to close it exactly the same six weeks every single summer. Well, obviously, sleeping out in the freezing cold is, is horrific and life-threatening. Sleeping out in the boiling heat is equally awful. It is absolutely awful what happens to your skin and to your body and the infestation sleeping out in the heat. So closing at the same time every single summer. I mean, I was never obviously shipped to the diplomatic service. At no point in that career that you described did anybody say to me, I tell you what, we'll get that Louise Casey to go over to the diplomatic service. It's not my speciality, as you can see. But it was without fighting, without macho, without truth to power, just getting the same people in the room and going, heat, horrible, lice, infestation, both closed at the same time, help me here, and they did. And that's not about people choosing not to help homeless people. It's about the fact that we can sometimes build a system and we can prop it up come what may without necessarily thinking about the consequences for the people on the human end of what it is we're all seeking to do. We did meet a government target on rough sleeping and the Labour administration did make uh, headway with that. That's great, that's fine. But the thing that we all took from it is that we reached out to some of the most vulnerable people that people said nobody could help and they got help. And many of them uh, are still with us and many of them are still alive and they're housed. And in a way, that's the thing that I take away from that, not necessarily meeting the target on rough sleeping, though I'm proud of that too. We wouldn't accept terms like won't engage as if homelessness was the person's problem. They were choosing not to engage with us. We wouldn't accept that and I won't accept that to this day. Um, I, I don't know the details of this case in Westminster, but I can tell you that in 2010 there was a serious case review, good for Lambeth, they did a serious case review into the death of a, a person in Lambeth and littered throughout their files was refused to engage. Well, we didn't get the offer right. We didn't get the offer right. No human being chooses to die on the streets. We're just not getting something right. The same way there are uh, areas of the world that use expressions like functional zero, and this is another easy option in terms of how, how you make something real and not a pipe dream, is that you can have uh, more beds available to people than the numbers of people sleeping on your streets. Well, I'm fresh back from America. I'm fresh back from what they call shelters, and I think they're inhumane containers that you wouldn't want animals to live in, let alone human beings. So, yeah you might have more shelter beds available to people, but it is not a human, humane and equal way to treat people in, in our society. We can meet targets whilst missing a point. I would also say that sometimes if you want to get stuff done, start with the hardest first. It's not about metaphoric low-hanging fruit, though political will often wants low-hanging fruit to build momentum, get good news stories, make everybody on side. My own view is, if you sort out the cases or issues that nobody believes can ever be done and you use the power of that, you get your own momentum and you get your own change. 
The system forgets who it's there for. When I was the anti-social behaviour czar, I've had such great jobs. When I was the anti-social behaviour czar, really popular, I was determined to stop the madness of youth centres always closing on Friday nights because it suited the services to do so. This is close to the wire. There I was in a new deal for communities area. Some of you in the room, dare I say it, might have been social policy for as long as I have and might remember we've gone from, in my memory, Hesseltine touching down in Toxteth with his uh, city challenge through to some other minister walking through Newcastle doing single regeneration budgets to the new dawn of new labour with uh, New Deal for Communities followed by another version of it with uh, neighbourhood renewal. My very own uh, little foray into this with the lesser known but equally important thing called respect and there we are. I found myself in uh, this place on a Wednesday. I've been in the afternoon with the police and the local authority and the community where they'd said to me, it's an absolute nightmare here on a Friday night, absolute nightmare. So I go up the youth centre, having a very nice afternoon, looked at the IT suite, corporate had given them an IT suite, empty, but went into it. On the settees, all the rest of it, with the kids, you can imagine, you know, for which we all have the power to give, the giving of ourselves, the faith in the power of humanity to do good. And I profoundly believe believe that if we can get this right we can rehumanize public services and when we do so we will change families their children and their lives and therefore all of our communities for the better i've also seen what happens when public service goes wrong strong purposeful leadership can be an enormous force for good but a lack of leadership a failure to tackle things because they're too hard can have a catastrophic effect on people's lives nothing brought this home to be more in my entire life than when I went with extraordinary colleagues to undertake an inspection into Rotherham Metropolitan Borough Council following Alexis Jay's report into child sexual exploitation. It has had a profound effect upon me in terms of my life, not only professionally but personally. I was expecting to find a local authority racked with guilt, wanting to learn the lessons of what gone wrong. Instead, I found denial. Denial of a problem due to fear of that being honest would have too tough implications. Denial of the reality of what was happening to children and in communities. I was there during the police crime commissioner elections and I watched the UKIP uh, placards go throughout the, time, go throughout the town milking and manipulating the issues around the Pakistani heritage community and child sexual exploitation. Denial by the police and public services of what was happening right under their noses, not helping anyone in the community and not least those from the Pakistani heritage community. They just help those people's lives get worse, not better tolerating underage pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases in very young girls because they had older men that were good boyfriends, quote direct from a children's services file. Denial of the facts that these girls were victims and not wayward teenagers that were asking for it. Denial that child sex exploitation was a crime. It was a terrible failure and not one I've talked about very frequently publicly. And I've had a long time to reflect on what I saw and heard in Rotherham, and it pains me still. What pains me most is how we, decent, good human beings and public servants, end up allowing the wrong thing to happen. I was under enormous pressure to name names, to scapegoat, and to write a report that meant people were up there in headlines. That was what the appetite was at the time. And we decided to write a report that was about the need for a system to change and a culture to change. And I've thought about subsequently, why did we do that? It felt like the right thing to do at the time. And I think this is one of the things about making sure you always try and get to what is right, because eventually that, that is going to be how you solve inequality and poverty. I think it's like a dial keeps moving and then it ends up in the wrong place. Nobody starts out thinking, I tell you what, I'll like a 13 year old end up being raped. Nobody does, unless you're a nasty criminal, but very few people do, certainly not people in the public sector. And it's like 
a denial, I call, of acceptability and unacceptability. And you can see it. You know, when does a 13-year-old vulnerable child turn into a 13-year-old teenager? Just flipping the word from child to teenager takes you in a certain direction. When does the home that they come from move from being a decent family to a family that's divorced and broken, another popular word that takes that dial and moves it in a different direction where you're caring less about that family because you think they're making their own choices. When does actually the boyfriend go from being too old and a possible troublemaker to actually, it's great, he's got his own car, he's able to run her around and he has work and can, I quote, look after her and the dial moves again. No bad person wrote that, that's, that's what happened. And then when does rape, in my mind, and torture become something that we consider consensual sex? And one day, someone that at the beginning of that process, a human being might have seen as a child, when she turned 13, she was raped. And he said to her, it's your 13th birthday, it's consensual sex. Well, fortunately, that man will not see the light of day for quite a number of years, but it justice took a long time for that victim. We didn't see it happening, nor did we talk about it if we did. And that's it, really. That's what haunts me. Uh, that's what haunts me, and that's what makes me think it's important to hold mirrors up and to ask difficult questions. How do we end up in a situation where good people did nothing or not enough and nobody was able to talk about it. My most recent work has been into integration and opportunity in what was termed as isolated communities. This was a really tough project to look at as there are so many voices, so many views and so many issues within those uh, words and those statements. And I have to say that it was done, I think, in my mind, you can't do that work without looking across the backdrop of several decades of an immigration policy that was at conflict with itself. So dare I caricature it in front of an audience from Sussex University, but I'm going to. Essentially, the immigration policy is at conflict with itself. The left have to say, all immigration is absolutely fine. How would London work? Everybody's welcome. We need to sort all of this out. And if you disagree with that, you're a bit dodgy and might be a UKIP supporter. God forbid there's UKIP supporters in the room. And if there are, I'll take you on. So anyway, I doubt it at Sussex. But anyway, I don't mind having an argument with a UKIP supporter. But that's what the left think. Open door policy. We need them. Everyone. Truth in some of that, a very particular position the left might take. The right, on the other hand, and I don't mean the extreme for right, just the right, would say, we want some people as long as they can contribute, but actually this is about numbers and we need to set targets on numbers. So what we hear from the right is targets, numbers, migration targets, immigration targets, numbers. We've set this target, we've set that target. We're managing the numbers. Somebody else says you're not managing the numbers. And so you get caught up in these two things on the left and the right. My point, call me a bureaucrat as a minute, for a minute, is that whichever one you're in, whichever one you want, keep them in, let them in, keep them out, keep them out, whichever you think you are, the truth of the matter is we didn't manage it. We didn't manage it. We haven't managed this process. We haven't been open about this process. We haven't thought about the consequences of the country growing the size of the town called, the city called Bradford, 400,000 people in one year. We didn't think about the consequences of that because we weren't able to talk about it. The same way that the other side keeps saying it's, it's meeting its targets on migration, and yet people living in areas haven't felt that. And whether that's uncomfortable or not uncomfortable to talk about, the fact is we haven't talked about it. And then you end up in a situation where that, that is the, the, the background to issues like Brexit, in my view, and it's the background to issues to some of these tensions in communities. So that was the backdrop to it. We're a great and tolerant country, in my view, where actually most of us just want to rub along, so much so that we find it almost impossible to counter the fact that that isn't true for everyone. We find it really odd that other people don't feel that way, and therefore, as social policy makers, well, that takes us a bit 
by surprise. Um, sometimes I think the tolerance of difference has allowed those with an intolerance of difference to get away with promoting not just uh, destructive and negative values, but anti-equality values. Now, whether this is far-right uh, extremism or Islamic extremism, we need to work hard to counter this and call it out more for what it is, and that involves having very difficult discussions that many want to avoid. And at times I feel, this is the first time I've said this, that central government has, albeit potentially inadvertently, created greater division and, ex and exclusion by confusing and conflating issues. My view and my hope was, and indeed remains, that we would have a bold, progressive integration strategy, not because of the hate mongers and extremists around issues to do with terrorism, counter-terrorism and prevent, but because the personal and citizen equalities of people in this country are so important. We should have an integration and a social exclusion strategy because women are equal to men, because disabled people in this country should enjoy exactly the same rights of those that aren't disabled, and that gay people should be able to get married, and that people of colour should enjoy exactly the same rights of any other human being of any other skin colour. It is about our society overall. It's not about something the Home Office is responsible for or the police are responsible for. Integration is about equalities. That's why we should be talking about it. No other reason in my view. The laws that we uphold in this country aren't some pick and mix, frankly, in a motorway service station. You can't pick one out and leave the others there. They come as a package through our parliament and they're upheld by our lawmakers and those that guard the guardians of our laws. The laws to defend religious minorities and their freedoms are exactly the same laws that say, I am equal to a man, that say gay people can love and marry, and blind people who have guide dogs have absolute right to get into any taxi in this country and not be turned away. At the backdrop of some of this is social and economic exclusion. I think it overlays all of it. For example, if we enjoyed equalities in this country, then women from Bangladeshi or Pakistani heritage communities would have a better deal. They are 61% economically inactive, as opposed to the 26% in the white population, and indeed, I think it's 30-something percent in other ethnic minority groups. And interestingly, they are less than half as likely as their male counterparts to speak English. That, ladies and gentlemen, no matter what the media and the mood music say, is not a story about religion. It is a modern tale of inequality. Now, call me a bit kind of done 10 years under New Labour for a moment, but if I was in charge, one of the ways to heal this country would be to set a good old fashioned target and a course that everyone of school and working age would speak a common language. No matter where you are from, where you would live, when you arrived here, what generation you're in, if we just got some of the basics right, we would prove to each other that we're in this together and a common language in all ways would help us. None of this is easy, but in my view, too many leaders have chosen to take the easier path when confronted with these issues in the path. Sometimes with good intent, I don't doubt that. And if I get some of this wrong and you disagree with me, it's not throughout a willingness to, to try and get this right. But I do feel that problems have been ducked and sometimes swept under the carpet or allowed to fester. And domestically, right now in this country, we need bravery in public policy, not cowardice. In all the roles that I have held, either in the charity world, uh, in, in places like shelters and other, all my time in government, I have had that privilege to shine a light into the dark places. And I've tried to do so, despite my reputation, with some kindness.
Having served within the civil service for 20 years, I've had a lot of time in the last few months to reflect on politics and some of the issues that I think I've covered on this evening. My first two prime ministers believe that everyone deserved the same start in life and that we should seek to create a fair and equal society. That was their language. That got action on issues like poverty, homelessness and indeed education. My second two prime ministers believed in looking after people and giving a chance to those less fortunate than themselves. That got us some action on things like problem families and indeed Theresa's record on those facing domestic violence. So the point I'm making is across that political divide, in some ways they ended up in similar places if they were motivated by different politics and possibly ideologies. A crude analysis in front of the university audience, I admit that, but I thought I'd leave it in there. The point I'm making is call it social exclusion, call it social inclusion, call it social mobility or call it social justice, and I've done all four. At the root of some of this division is the word poverty, and that we can do something about. That is why I remain hopeful for this little country that we live in, why I want to continue to serve in the battle against poverty and exclusion in all its forms. I believe in a hand up and not a hand out, helping people stand on their own two feet and get on with their own lives, not creating a dependency on a charity or a system. I do actually believe in people power. We all have the power and the capacity to treat someone with dignity and compassion and in so doing help them lead a better life. Witness the local response to the Grenfell disaster where local people rushed to help those affected and each other, many of whom had absolutely nothing to rub together themselves. I believe in the power of love and kindness. I believe in the hope that humanity brings. I believe in the service of others. But I say to you this evening, we all have the power to help. We all have a role in creating a just, equal and fair society. We all in this room carry that responsibility. That's why we cannot let these fundamental issues of integration but of equality be a pipe dream nor, ladies and gentlemen, do we need to. Thank you very much indeed.